today. Okay, the other thing, I want to go over a little bit of the bacterial resistance. Many of you did this for extra credit. I just want to go over, and especially in reading the brain pop game and the agricultural lab on Canvas, and then these, I just want to reiterate a few key things in terms of language used to describe natural selection, especially in regard to antibiotic resistance, um, and a few things about labs in general. So one is many of the answers that you need or information in regard to the answers are in the preliminary information. I find that students go, cool, nothing, nothing, nothing to do here, nothing to do here. Oh, I got a little thing here I got to do. Okay, nothing, 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 right? Nothing to do. I don't have to read anything. Okay, here. Oh, wait, what's this about? Maybe I should back up a little bit. Don't do that. <laughs> Sit down and read from start to finish. Read the lab. It takes probably five, ten minutes to go through because a lot of the things that you're going to reflect on in the lab and in the discussion are in the preliminary information. So please do that. The other thing is I'm going to keep taking little point ones off every time you use the word it. Stay away from it. Stay away from they, them, their. Ambiguous terms I need to and you guys need to start practicing in life and especially in biology explaining what it is. Because I've seen some answers that say it will happen to it when it is ready for it. What, what, what does that mean? I can get an idea of what you mean, but I want to know that you know what you're talking about. And so you need to show me you know what you're talking about. So stop using it. It's just a bad habit in general in life. Um, and sometimes people say, well, I can't write this sentence without using it. You can. Think about it. It takes a second to think about it. So those are just kind of two basic things. Um, let's go through this, these questions, just to reiterate ways you probably should have been answering them. So remember that with this lab, So the data that I gave you had two bacterial plates. They were E. coli bacteria, a common bacteria that's found especially in our digestive system, but also all over our body. For the most part, E. coli is very, very important to our health, our digestion for fighting off other bad bacteria. So what we did was we plated the E. coli we swipe it this way, then we go halfway, we swipe it that way, gives us full coverage. What we typically find with the E. coli is the E. coli grows well on the bacterial agar plate. The agar is like a jelly that has nutrients that help the bacteria grow. So what we did with this other plate was we added ampicillin to the agar. And when we did that, we also swiped that way, swiped halfway, but found that we got only a few colonies of growth. However, what that showed us is that natural selection has favored some of the E. coli here that prior to being exposed to the ampicillin, E. coli here in this colony had already by chance resistance to this specific antibiotic, ampicillin, so that when we plated it out, most of the bacteria died off, right? Most of them die, but a few colonies survive in the presence because these already by chance had resistance to the ampicillin antibiotic. The ampicillin, which is the environment 
does not cause or promote mutation. The mutations are in a few of the bacteria. So I just want to go over questions. So that was a little background. So um, question number four said, if penicillin resistance in the bacterial population, if, sorry, if penicillin, if, <laughs> let me start again. If penicillin resistance appears in the bacteria population, did the penicillin cause the mutation? Explain. So the answer is no. Um, the penicillin or ampicillin, whichever one we're talking about, did not cause a mutation. Again, in some of these, the mutation already by chance existed. Those that had the resistance to the antibiotic survived. They were favored in the environment of that specific antibiotic that they had the resistance to. They survived. They reproduced. They passed on the advantageous gene for resistance to the antibiotic to their offspring their offspring reproduced. And in relationship to that brain pop game, those that, re those that survived, um, one of the things I didn't like, I don't like about that is that they call them good bacteria and bad bacteria. And it's just bacteria that don't have resistance and bacteria that do have resistance. Some of the things that we generally try, I think they just reduced it down to very simplistic terms, but at a college level, we avoid saying good and bad in terms of evolution. We avoid saying strong and weak. That's a big one that as you guys go on and you take a, you'll probably take an Evo Eco class, which is evolution and ecology. Um, your professors, when you go into your second or third year of college, they will slam you hard if you use good, bad. If you use strong and weak, they'll be like, Rrr. Don't use those. Be specific, not resistant, resistant, okay? So just to prepare you for the next steps in terms of terms that you should use. So um, these guys are favored. They're not good, they're favored in the environment of this antibiotic because they already by chance had the mutation to this antibiotic. All the rest of them that died off were not favored in the environment of this. Okay, so just to term wise. And then it said most, number five says most bacteria did not originally possess antibiotic resistance. So, right, if we're looking at all of these, the ones that had originally would have been ones like here, here, and here. For example, if we're comparing the two plates, and most of them, the ones that are in black, did not already have resistance to the antibiotic, but these ones in blue, which we have here, did. Okay, so most bacteria did not originally possess antibiotic resistance. Explain how natural selection has led to the population that have resistance to some antibiotics. So again, in this environment, so I should go by no ampicillin in this environment, these ones that already had, by chance, resistance to this antibiotic were favored. They survived easily. They reproduced, and they passed on those advantageous genes to their offspring. Next step in evolution is it's really important that your offspring also reproduce and keep passing on the genes and keep the generations going. So I wanted to see something like that. Most of you guys, you guys in general did a good job. Number six says, decades ago, doctors often gave a shot of penicillin to patients with a common cold. Explain whether this was a good or bad decision from our perspective today. So common cold, if you didn't know, is a virus and it tells us in the preliminary information. So this is one where I see, oh, they weren't reading. So it does go through that and we put it in there. So this information didn't used to be in the preliminary information as we talked about it because most students were getting it wrong and we're like, well, it seems that the problem is we're not providing them enough information that common colds are a virus and we should probably tell them about that in the preliminary information so they're ready to answer that question. While the number of students that got this more correct went up, it still is about 50% of you write weird things about 
that have nothing to do with it being a virus and we don't treat viruses with antibiotics. So again, read your preliminary information. So that was why it's a bad decision. And this is something for you to remember as a consumer for your own health. If you go to a doctor and you have cold-like symptoms, flu-like symptoms, corona, coronavirus-like symptoms, and the doctor says, I'm gonna give you an antibiotic, say, whoa, 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 time out. What bacterial infection do I have that warrants you giving me an antibiotic? And then they go like, ooh, this person knows things. I've done it a lot of times, especially with my son still, and it says like, you know, decades ago they did this. They still, a lot of doctors still do this because they feel like you as the consumer want something to walk away and be happy. And I'm always like, no, 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 that's the wrong thing. And I'll say, wait, I'm, I'm confused. You didn't take a swab of his nasal cavity and his m mouth cavity. Why would you be per prescribing an antibiotic? Because you don't even know what bacterial infection he has because you didn't swab. So why are we doing this? And then the doctor gets all like, well, uh, well, in case there's this infection, in case they have it, I go, yeah, but there's a lot of overuse of antibiotics in this country. And so I would prefer we don't go this route. And then the doctor gets all like, oh, they get surprised. Remember you as a patient, when you go in, if you're, sometimes we get nervous because they're doctors, right? You're all gonna be somebody huge and you're already smart, right? But a lot of times in this country, people are like, oh, the doctor's so smart, I have to agree. You don't have to, you can politely ask them questions. And so if you need to write your questions down on a piece of paper, I often do that because I just forget once I get in there and they're usually walking out the door and I've had doctors who are walking out the door and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I have four questions for you. And I pull out my paper and they're like, because oh. they're behind, they're crammed with patients and et cetera. I'm like, I'll make it quick, but I got to get these answered. So do that for yourself. Okay. So that's a good one to know. Um, it says, number seven says, for health reasons, many countries in the European Union and Canada have banned the sub-therapeutic treatment of livestock. Why do you think the United States has not banned sub-therapeutic treatment of livestock? And that means that it's kind of like in relationship a little bit to what I said with the last question is, if you don't know something has a bacterial infection, why treat them ahead of time with antibiotics? It's not necessary, but what we typically do in this country is we add antibiotics to the food. And again, this is all in the preliminary information. Um, we add antibiotics to the food in case in their very tight living quarters they get an infection and hoping that the antibiotic that we have been feeding them with covers that infection. But a lot of times it doesn't, they don't go to get, anyway, you've read it. You read it again if you need to. So um, the reason why the United States keeps doing this is because the conditions in which we grow our livestock are in big, huge factories, and they cram as many animals in there as possible, and the animals are like this together. If you were crammed together and you had to fight to get to food, do you think it might get a little violent? Yeah, so the animals will get a little violent and they'll hurt each other, and when they get injuries, cuts and things like that, they get infections sometimes. And so we, as this, not we, but they treat them with antibiotics because they know these things are going to happen, but a lot of times those antibiotics are not needed and they do a, a lot more antibiotics over time, they give them more varieties, and then you eat that meat and then we end up promoting environments like this within our own bodies and antibiotics don't work for us. Anyway, the reason why the United States continues to do these processes is because instead of having huge fields where you can grow maybe 300 cows for your burgers and the producer of the farmer can only get, let's say, a million dollars a year out of their field of cows, what if they put a whole bunch of these factory farms on there and they can make $10 million by using this method of cramming them in, feeding them antibiotics. Um, a lot of times in the United States, it's promoted, just do what you gotta do today to make as money, much money as you can, and don't worry about who you're harming. The government also subsidizes this process. They give money to the um, factory farms, 
as opposed to like organic farmers who would grow them outside and give them more space and do a natural processes. You saw the data in that agricultural lab. One of the things is that it's a small data set. However, it does show the difference between if you treat with antibiotics, you end up with antibiotic resistant bacteria in the people who eat them. If you don't treat with antibiotics, you don't end up with antibiotic resistant bacteria in the people who eat those other So wait, tell me the relationship you're making between the water and the meat. So are you saying like in the relationship that they're like promoting bottled water and it's not good for us is the same as they're promoting this kind of meat and not good for us? No, what I'm saying is, is just because the label say it's been treated with antibiotics, it hasn't been treated with antibiotics. Oh, that that goes into the water. Yeah. yeah, and then it's not filtered and then we get it. Yeah, so we get the exposure to this kind of system in our water too. Oh yeah, so we get the, like, we have, it's not even a double whammy, it's a like, multifaceted whammy of all the bad things that we're bombarded with. <laughs> it's one of the reasons why like cancer rates have gone way up, is that we're just bombarded by all kinds of things, plus antibiotic issues, and uh, we can go on and be sad. We're already talking sad, right? So yes, <laughs> yes. Um, so it's all, that question is just about money fast. It's not because we are demanding it necessarily, but it's because they're like pumping it out. And as long as meat is cheap, then you're gonna keep buying it, right? So the, there's a lot of like, this gets into a lot of politics and subsidies of government. You can read real deep into the politics, but a lot of money, the government actually promotes those farmers who do it in a bad way, as opposed to a good way. So a lot of it is like government, a lot of it is our own control. Um, somebody had said, if we stopped buying meat, period, what would happen? I've been saying this for 30 years. McDonald's practices in many, many, many ways for many, many, many years have changed since I was a kid. My parents always say for, I haven't eaten McDonald's in over 30 years because, and I generally, my family, we don't eat fast food because of just a lot of, a lot of these issues. And for us fast, everyone says, what do you eat? And I'm like, well, we pull up to a grocery store and we go in and we, it's as fast as standing in like your car going in the line often times. And we go to right there when you walk in, what's there? Fruits and vegetables and bread and things like that. And so we go in and we get fruits and veggies and hummus and fresh baked bread. And then we go back to our car. It's really not that much longer than driving up because a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't have time to walk into a grocery store. I'm like, it doesn't take much time because you don't go, don't go into the processed food. Just go in this area and then check up. And they're like, uh, well, right. well, you know, so. <laughs> Anyway, um, and then the last thing, the last question, there's another question where it's like, answer what you're being asked on the labs, because it said, there's a high demand for inexpensive meat in the United States. What could you, and we put it in bold and caps, what could you do to change this? And so I want baseline realistic, and a lot of people just said, like, I could stop eating meat, or I could eat meat one day less a week. I could eat the Beyond Burger instead of, cow meat. And then some people will say, I will change the whole system. And that's it. And I'm like, but how, how are you going to do that? You can work on that, right? You can make social media campaigns. You can make a whole YouTube channel. I mean, with social media now, you can do that. But a lot of people will say, I am going to change the whole system. And I'm like, and then that's it. And I'm like, okay, 
but it asks, how are you going to do this? Not what can you do, but how are you actually going to do it? So just be careful in reading what we're asking for. All right, any questions? See the complexity? There's a lot of complexity in this whole little two-plate system here. And again, very important that as you go on, you understand and you don't just throw a bunch of vocab words together and go, yeah, that's fine. It's not. It's very particular. Okay. Again, any questions? Okay. So let's pick up. I know that was a long-winded thing, but I was going to go over it in lab, and then I thought, well, I'll do it now. Okay. So we were up to the first cells. The first living things, little single unicellular organisms, that's only where we're at. Look at how long ago, almost 4 billion years ago. So we're still talking for a really long time, but these were the first things. They were prokaryotic, and we're going to get into a little more details of vocab. If you don't know, pro means um, no, karyotic means nucleus. These are cells that have no nucleus, so very simple. Just because it's simple doesn't mean that it's not hardy and strong, because they've been around. These things are still around today. They've been around for a real long time. And if the humans get wiped out, guess who's still going to be around? For sure, these, right? So again, like strong and weak, we don't use that. All right, so they were anaerobic. And, again, just like pro means no or without, aerobic, if you do aerobic exercise, you're getting oxygen. So it means that without oxygen, they have lived. If you remember from last week, we talked about early Earth had no free oxygen. So like how we breathe in free oxygen, O2. Oxygen was in water, but it was covalently bonded to something else. So the atmosphere had no oxygen early on. Then, after a bit of time, a series of by chance mutations, cyanobacteria come about. These are photosynthetic bacteria. Before plants, before algae, these were the first things that could carry out photosynthesis. So let's answer this question. As a result of the cyanobacteria undergoing the process of photosynthesis, what were they putting in the atmosphere that wasn't already there? Oxygen. Yeah, oxygen. So O2 starts to populate our atmosphere. So photosynthetic evolution occurs around three and a half billion years ago. It starts to accumulate. So that's good, and we're going to talk about why it's good, and hopefully you'll reflect on why it's good. But one of the things that happens is that a lot of organisms find this toxic. So we have a big switch in evolution, and what's favored as oxygen builds up, those organisms that can utilize oxygen and keep going are favored. Those who find it toxic to them die off. So we have a different environmental switch and what's favored and what's not favored here. So let's think about why organisms would be favored who can use oxygen. Aerobic metabolism, again, aerobic means oxygen metabolism, is an advantage over anaerobic metabolism because why? So give these a read. All right, which one is the correct answer? Yeah, A is correct, if you didn't know. That metabolism with oxygen releases more ATPs, or usable energy per glucose. So just a little, let's reflect on equations. If you took bio 111, cell and molecular bio, you remember that there's two kinds of metabolism you focused on. 
aerobic and anaerobic. So with anaerobic, when you take glucose and really any food, we break down those bigger organic molecules that we use as nutrients or energy, nutrients and energy. You get carbon dioxide, you get two ATP, so we're kind of focusing on this thing. You get some other product, maybe it's lactic acid, maybe it's um, alcohol and then you get a lot of loss of energy as heat as well. So these things are really taking up the majority of the energy that's here originally. So now at this time, start adding oxygen to the equation. And if you have organisms that have a mutation to utilize that oxygen to help break down their food, what they get is carbon dioxide. So we still get some carbon dioxide, but look at the difference in ATPs. Are these both doing the same job of breaking down food? Yeah, so that's what we mean by respiration is to help break down our food. But when you use oxygen to do it, you have a more efficient process. You get two ATPs as opposed to 36. So think if I told two of you, let's say this half of the room, I'm gonna hire both, I'm gonna hire everybody. And this half of the room, I say, well, first I say, you're all gonna do this job, okay? And this half of the room, I say, I'm gonna pay you $2 an hour to do it. And I say, but I'm gonna pay you guys $36 an hour. Same job. You guys gonna be mad? Oh yeah, right? Same job, breaking down food, 2 ATP 36, so much more efficient of a process. Again, this all goes to random mutations that as you have those photosynthetic cyanobacteria that start pumping out the oxygen, at that same time, you have bacteria that have mutations to utilize that oxygen to break down their food more efficiently. So the two things are going on and it starts changing the way organisms evolve because now organisms can be more efficient at evolution. Big thing, efficient at evolution, meaning that they have an easier time surviving. They don't have to chase for food as hard. They can focus on other things like reproduction and they can pass on those genes for easier way to get your food to their offspring, offspring keep reproducing and things change quickly. So again, aerobic respiration, key, huge factor, using the oxygen to more efficiently break down your food, frees up more time for things like reproduction, easier survival, pass on those advantageous survival genes to your offspring and then you see those changes that more organisms are favored who can do this. So would you agree with me that one of the most significant things that happen, one of the most significant mutations in the history of life is the ability to produce free oxygen? Yeah, super, super key. Okay, next thing that evolved by chance, membranes. So remember that our cells that we had up until this time had no nucleus. The nucleus
So before you had the DNA and it's just in the cell. Now you have mutations that take that DNA and it gives it an extra layer of protection. So that's a good thing, right? Between a prokaryotic cell, nothing protecting the nucleus to you have a membrane that's giving an extra layer of protection to your cell's DNA. So that's a really good thing. Other organelles develop by chance that also have membranes and gives better protection to processes. Ability of membrane is gonna give the ability to pump certain things in, pump certain things out, prevent certain things from coming in. So we have this whole new system that's more efficient again. So how do they believe what's one of the hypotheses of how membranes came about? So it is hypothesized that you had two different kinds of cells. I like this one because it looks like a Pac-Man. So you have this cell who's a very ferocious predator cell and can go around gobbling up all kinds of cells. Now, the cell comes to a cell that can utilize oxygen to more efficiently break down its own food. We now call that the mitochondria. So the cell is like, I could eat this and I could get that cell as food, or I could take that cell and I can incorporate it into my cell body and we could have a symbiotic relationship where this is going to, I'm going to give it food and it's going to utilize its own processes of efficiently breaking down that food while using oxygen. It's going to take, take what it needs and then it's going to give me food more easily. So instead of me going out and eating lots and lots and lots of things, I could kind of chill and relax and focus a little more on reproduction and other fun things in life. And this can process my energy by me giving it a little bit. So that's the hypothesis. Now, granted, I'm not saying that these cells were thinking like, hey, you, I'm going to, it just kind of happenstance went that way. So again, you have a predatory cell, incorporates a mitochondrial type cell into its body, eventually over time becomes the organelle, the mitochondria. Then we have other cells that have also incorporated photosynthetic -like bacteria into their cell bodies. And you have a cell now. Now this would be cool, right? It could really chill if you had photosynthetic organelles that could take the energy from the sun and the carbon dioxide that you're breathing out and it could produce energy that this other organelle over here could take that energy and that oxygen and it could process to make more efficient energy to fuel me and I could just sit back in the sun and relax all day. So which of the following would be an advantage of multicellularity? So having many different kinds of cells, multi meaning many, cellularity cells. All right, what do you think? Yeah, so all of these are good reasons. So here's a case where that all of the above is not a tricky thing. It's actually showing you that every single one of these is good. So remember again, if you see an answer that's all of the above, read them all. Not a bad idea if you have a paper test to cross off or write like, that sounds good, oh, that sounds good, that sounds good, that sounds good, right? Or cross off as you go. So all of these things are really good. I just want to focus on one, is that if you are one cell and you have kind of a lethal mutation, for whatever reason you have cells that start pumping out something toxic, they by chance had a mutation to produce a toxic substance that eventually is going to kill you off, what might happen is that you might have a few of those cells, but you might have other cells that can gobble up those cells. We have organelles called lysosomes that go around and gobble up cells or merge with cells, I should say, to get rid of lethal type cells. We have an immune system now that looks for things that are toxic or lethal to us. 
And so if you have many different kinds of cells who do many different kinds of services for you, the chance of your cell turning on itself are less likely. The first eukaryotic cells develop about 1.7 billion years ago. So we're about halfway through the history of life. You means true or with, karyotic means nucleus, so this is a true nucleus or has a nucleus. So again, we get that protection to our genetic material, which is good. Eventually, multicellularity becomes more favored in many different lines of organisms. Does not mean that the prokaryotic cells or the unicellular organisms have gone away, because some of them are doing fine in the environments where they live and they're favored, but also this is favored in different environments. And we end up getting different organisms who, as they get bigger in size, become more difficult for smaller organisms or unicellular organisms to eat. Remember at this time, everything is still underwater for the most part, because water is covering the earth. So the earliest, this is one thing that a lot of times on exams, students will get wrong. Land organisms come around later. Let's just say land animals come around later. The first animals are in the water. First animals are in the water. So remember that if you say something like plants on land, what came first, animals or plants on land? Animals in water came before plants on land. After plants start to colonize land, then land animals come. So we have water animals, plants on land, land animals. So just remember that distinction that the first animals came about before plants went to land. Because the first animals were eating algae, cyanobacteria. They were getting energy in that way. So first animals, again, water animals one billion years ago. Because of the ability of the sophistication of things like carbon dating, other forms of dating of rocks and fossils, as well as the ability to extract some DNA or RNA from fossils, what we're gonna see and what you probably have seen in your lifetime is a lot of changing in the um, tree of life and when things were first come about and then they say, no, it actually was later or it was earlier. So we do see a lot of sophistication in biotechnology that allows us to keep updating our history of life. So probably what we're learning today, next semester will be outdated already. So just know that. All right, land invasion, right? We already have animals and water land gets invaded, there's some bad things about that. If I'm a jellyfish, bloop, 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 right? I'm made of like jello-y substance. I'm 95% water. If I'm a jellyfish and I go on to land, am I still all round and have my tentacles? No, I'm like bleh. I'm a big ball of jelly. So gravity does not favor a lot of the organisms that are in water because they're nice and flowing in water. Put them on land and they look totally blobby and different. So gravity is not a good thing. It's pretty harsh. If I'm in water, I can always get water to my cells. If I'm in land, I might have pockets of water like this, but I might have to try and make my way. And if I'm a jellyfish, how easy it is it for me to be bloop, bloop, bloop over to the water again if I'm stuck on land? Not very easy. When I live in the water, I can go down deeper and sunlight wouldn't affect me. So I can go get some sunlight and I can get away from it by going deeper. If I'm on land and there's no trees around or shade, sunlight we know can be very harsh to biological molecules. If I'm used to just reproducing, I let go of my sperm and egg in the water and they combine with the organism next to me, 
If I release my sperm and egg on land, they can dry up really quickly. But there's some good things. Nobody else is there. If I'm an animal, for example, and there's all of these plant sources that I can eat, my competition goes way down. So that's good. So if I have mutations that allow me to withstand all of that, then I can have it all. We see the mutations to plants get sophisticated in some ways in that we get flowers. Uh, let me step back and say one of the other mutations that occurs to plants, and we'll learn more about next week, is that plants have a waxy coating on them. Waxy coating allows for me to be more waterproof and have protections to keep water inside of my body. So think about like desert cactuses is they have a very thick waxy coating. Their skin is really thick because there's a wax coating on it. Keeps the water inside, prevents them from sweating or transpiring. So those evolutions are good. We'll talk about xylem and phloem allow things like water to flow up through my body and allow me to photosynthesize here and transport sugars and food down to my body. In terms of reproduction, swamps can be similar to the sea in that you could release your sperm and egg and then they float together. But also, what if you're in a dry area, the evolution of seeds Seeds have the embryos inside, protected, waterproof coating, hard. So that's good. You could protect your babies like that. And then also flowers. With flowers, you have pollen that can float in the air. Pollen grains have sperm inside of them. And so the pollen can float in the air. It can be transported if you have a pollinator that your pollinator can come and drink some nectar from you that you produce and make available to them, but also then they get the pollen all over them. And as they go from one plant to another plant, they're just dropping the pollen off. So flowers have a lot of great advantages too. So how do animals go from being blobby things to being able to withstand all of those challenges on land? Well, we have the advantages of fish-like organisms about 400 million years ago. So now we're under a billion now. We first start seeing the advances on land less than a billion years. So this kind of blows my mind because I know that everything that we see out there on land is less than a billion, so less than a quarter of the age of the Earth. Some of the mutations, one is that you have these kind of fish. These are mud skippers. The earliest fish were believed to have very strong front fins that they could use like arms to help them climb and crawl from the dry areas to puddles. They also had a mutation to their stomachs, a pouch that could take oxygen in and utilize it to help them. Fish were in the water. Fish in the water breathe with gills. If you take a fish out of water, it doesn't survive very long because the gills need to have full moisture all the time. Take it on the land and the dry air is very harsh. And so then the gills start to collapse. But if you have a stomach pouch that can process oxygen, much like eventually a series of mutations leads to lungs, then that's a really good thing. Again, if there's not a lot of other animals on land, you don't have much competition for your food and your resources. And eventually what we see over time are mutations that lead to lungs that give rise to amphibians and reptiles. So let's talk a little bit about the amphibians. A series of by chance mutations led to amphibians. Some interesting things about amphibians, their skin always has to remain moist 
So that amphibians have to always be tied to a water source or live in very humid environments. Water, so one of the things about amphibians uh, is that amphibians have very primitive lungs. They're not as efficient as a reptile, a bird, or a um, human uh, a primate, I should say, the primate lungs. Because their lungs are not super efficient, one of the things that has benefited them is the mutation to the skin, uh, keeping it moist, allows them to actually breathe through their skin. So they do two primary uh, ways of breathing. One is through the lungs and the other is through their skin. And the water on the skin helps facilitate the movement of very tiny molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen in and out. Here's the other thing. We could see a close tie. Remember embryology when we talked about that as a evidence for evolution piece of data. What do tadpoles look like? They look like fish. So here we see that evolution of going from those lobe fin fishes to a series of mutation that give rise to the amphibians, but they still retain some of the embryology characteristics of what we saw with the fish. So kind of interesting. Also, they do a metamorphosis from embryos in water to frogs, newts, salamanders, etc., on land. And as they do that metamorphosis, when they're in water, they are slowly losing their tails if they're a frog. If they're a salamander, they might they'll, they will keep it. Um, but if we're talking about frogs, so they lose the tail, they start to get little buds for their fore limbs and hind limbs. And so eventually when they are fully equipped with maybe they go on land and eventually they lose their tail or they lose their tail before they come out of the water, but they have these limbs for hopping and getting around. Also transition from gill-like structures to lung-like structures. Eventually you have mutations that occur to the amphibians that give rise to an offshoot, which are the reptiles. They have specific adaptations that favor them and allow them to go and live in different environments from the amphibians and be favored in those environments due to these mutations. So one is a change, a mutation to their eggs instead of being tied closely to water because your eggs have to be grown in water. They have a mutation for a leathery coating on their eggs. Reptile eggs look like kind of leathery balls and they're more pliable. They're not hard like chicken eggs, they're very soft. But it allows them to have their eggs on land and not get dehydrated. So a mutation that's favored by them. Other mutations that are favored is that they have better lungs. So favorable mutations to their lungs to make them have more advanced lungs, which then also simultaneously, they have a mutation to their skin, which allows them to not have to be tied to water, but mutations for scaly skin allows them to be in drier environments and the scales actually provide a bit of a waterproof barrier that prevents their bodies from dehydrating. Other mutations have happened to give rise to, to other animal groups, the reptiles and the mammals to be favored in different environments. So remember what we're having from animals who go on to land is we have all of this divergent evolution that if the animal has characteristic and allows them to go into water, they're favored, that leads to the amphibians. If you have animals that are able to have mutations that allow them to be in land and drier environments, you have the favoring of the reptiles. You have animals who can go into colder environments because they have outer covering mutations for things like fur and feathers. So it allows them to go into environments where they're favored, that it's colder. And so we start to see this divergent evolution from a common animal ancestor. We also have mutations to the 
metabolic system that we have going from ectothermic environments, like reptiles, for example, have to sun themselves. They have to get warmth from their environment to speed up their metabolisms. So that's why most reptiles are active during the day when it's sunny, and then they rest at night because they're more lethargic. They don't have that heat. They're cold, right? So they're not going to move around as much. Us, we have an endothermic environment which allows us in the processes of our metabolism and our environment to capture some of that heat and keep our bodies at a more regular body temperature, which again, it favors us in colder environments. As I mentioned before, other mutations to our skin allow us to develop insulation, thicker layers of fat, but also when we're talking about birds, feathers allow for insulation and hair on mammals. So it's kind of interesting to see just some real basic, I mean, you can get into very specific more mutations that have favored this divergent evolution, but just some of these big, more obvious mutations, you can see how all these animals have diverged or gone into other environments. So a little bit about birds. Feathers allow for temperature regulation, but feathers also allow for flying. Temperature regulation allows birds and mammals to take advantage of a whole new time of day, the evening, the nighttime. So there's this whole half of the day where birds and mammals can be out and about and have less competition from the reptiles, the fish, and the amphibians. Feathers, bones eventually become mutations for being lighter and lighter and lighter, allows those mutations to be favored in the air and flying. So the birds take advantage of this whole other environment from their series of mutations, the air, the tops of the trees, they can get away from the mammals. We do still have some mutations that favor um, birds in different ways. So like the ostrich, for example, is a flightless bird. They're way too heavy to fly, but they're big and they have these beaks and they're very aggressive so that they can be favored on land. So even within individual groups, you can see some mutations still stick from the past. Penguins are flippers too. Remember, penguins use their flippers not to fly, but to swim really well, fly in the water. Hopefully you remember Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is a species that shows where birds and reptiles started to diverge from one another. And you see many characteristics of Archaeopteryx being bird, feathers, These kind of scaly legs are starting to show us some relationship in birds to the reptiles. Reptiles have more claws. We can see that relationship in Archaeopteryx to the reptiles. So we see a little bit of both creatures there. And then the mammals. Mammals were around at the tail end of the dinosaurs. The mammals that were around during the dinosaurs were probably really, really small. And so here you're like, wait, dinosaurs were enormous and these guys were small. Well, it allows them to kind of hide from the dinosaurs, allows the mammals to go up into trees and camouflage themselves in deep in the trees, allows them to eat smaller plants that the dinosaurs really weren't going to pick out. So they take advantage of things that the dinosaurs aren't necessarily taking advantage of. Another mutation that was favorable amongst the mammals as opposed to the dinosaurs, we could have the ability to grow our offspring inside of our bodies, we as humans still as mammals do that today and all ma most mammals, I should say most mammals, still do this. And what that does is it allows you to keep your offspring inside of you while they're growing, and you protect them. 
You give them food. So there's lots of great advantages to that. Dinosaurs go through a mass extinction. Mass extinctions have been a natural part of evolution. When we're talking about mass extinction, it means the sudden disappearance of many, 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 many different species all at once. Usually some big environmental issue happens and most organisms are swept away. So what is believed to have gotten the dinosaurs was that a meteorite crash about 65 million years ago stirred up a lot of dust into the atmosphere, blocked UV rays from hitting the Earth, or the majority of UV rays a little bit got through that dust, and so if you're a big giant herbivore dinosaur and you're eating big giant plants and suddenly those big giant plants start to die off because they're not getting enough sunlight to survive, all the big giant herbivore dinosaurs start to die off. If you're a carnivore, all of your food, the big giant herbivore dinosaurs have died off because the plants have died off. But remember, the mammals are around and the little plants that can still get enough photosynthesis to survive is your food. So little mammals are eating the little food. Dinosaurs are dying off and they're like, party. These things that would pick us off like little snacks are gone. And so their predators die off, less competition. And so when the dinosaurs die off, you see this explosion of mammals. That was only about 65 million years ago. So I know I've said this before, that when people say things like, I don't believe in climate change, and then I say, well, it's always been happening. Climate change, the climate changing from ice age to warm age to ice age to warm age, we know that those cycles have been happening ever since the existence of Earth. And then people go like, oh, that's true. We do have a lot of data to show that what we are doing now as modern humans after the Industrial Revolution has accelerated or exaggerated natural climate change. So climate change has always been around. Things like volcanic eruptions, meteorite crashes, droughts, storms, all the things that we see today, those things have affected organisms through the history of life on Earth. So it's always been happening. Climate change has always been causing mass extinctions to happen. Imagine you live in an area and drought happens. Will it affect almost every organism in that area? Yes, it will, right? So climate change, always been a thing, always promoting extinction. Another thing that has promoted organisms moving into different areas is continental drift. Our land masses are all on different tracks. At one point in time, they were all connected and they move apart and they move together. So we always see the land masses moving over time. If we look back at the history of these land masses, what we can see is if we go back 340 million years ago, you see these as the major land masses and you have them labeled. And think about in terms of puzzles, if they were all connected, look at the evidence that South America and Africa were once part of the same major land mass because today, look at that, it's like two pieces of a puzzle, right? So we do see a lot of evidence for them moving over time. If you have organisms that all lived together and we're all connected, but then suddenly you start to have like here major separations. Think about like Darwin when he went on his voyage and he looked at rabbits where from his home and then rabbits when he looked at rabbits from here and here, that they used to all be part of the same major land mass, but as those masses move, environments change, certain mutations favor living in different environments over time. So we start to get organisms who look alike, but are different. 
And so when we get into the next unit and we start to look at species, genus, these different groupings, how over time we see them have moved apart. When the dinosaurs died off, we had a series of adaptive radiation. After every mass extinction, you have adaptive radiation that as a big event happens where the majority of species go away, those that have mutations that favor them for living after that big environmental issue, they are the only ones there, less competition, more resources, so they start to radiate out or move into all these environments that other organisms were in. And that's what we call adaptive radiation. They radiate out because they are well adapted. This is what we're left with in terms of the primates. Again, small, mostly herbivores, and we will get to them next. All right, so let's pick which evolved first. Choose the correct order. Give yourself a second to read them over. Remember my little hint I gave you about animals and plants. And what would you choose as the correct answer? So D is the best one. You have prokaryotic cells, mutation to some of them that allow oxygen to accumulate. You have cells that have membranes specifically protecting the nucleus. More and more multicellular cells begin to be favored in different environments, animals in water, then land plants. Okay, so let's go on to talk about primate evolution specifically. All right, so we're gonna start out with mammals, which the primates are part of the mammal group. Early mammals, early mammals were small the benefit of live birth protecting your offspring inside of your body, always exceptions, monotremes like the platypus still lays eggs, hair allows us to be active day, night, cold environments as well. All of these adaptations by chance mutations allow us to have more energy to get food and really, really important to reproduce. Pass on those advantageous genes to our offspring who in evolution are favored if they can also reproduce and keep passing on the genes and keep us going. So let's talk about within the mammal group, we're gonna look at the primates and we're gonna lead to Homo sapiens. So early primates, we saw them about 80 million years ago. Remember that overlaps with the dinosaurs a little bit. Small, lived in trees, probably herbivorous. Eventually, series of mutations allow for the great apes, and then eventually series of mutations that split off to allow for the modern humans. There are still a lot of characteristics that even within the primate group are retained today. Many of them eat leaves and fruit. They're more herbivorous or vegetarians or herbivores. There are groups that are nocturnal. We'll look at some of the characteristics of them. And a lot of the primates still can take advantage of going in the trees. So let's talk about some of the characteristics that are retained today from early primates to us and things that we share that allowed us to be here. So again, we're leading ourselves from primates 
mutations that give offshoots of the early primates to the different groups that lead to the modern humans. Okay, so some things that we still have today. You're doing it right now. You're grasping your pencils, right? And so we see that as an early adaptation. You, different primate groups have different uses for those grasping hands, certainly. One is we can have well-controlled actions, like holding your pencil, like picking from trees, climbing, and other beneficial things that we found. Um, precision grip, so as I just mentioned what you're doing today, also could allow our ancestors to write notes in caves. Gone out for the day, I'll be back. Sewing allows us to have more warmth, make tents, clothing. But also we have a power grip in our grasping hands. So if you needed to take a rock and smash a smaller animal on the head so you can eat it, you could do that. Or throw a spear. We have a lot of power in our grip too today. Binocular vision, two eyes that work together to focus on one image, give us more precision in what we see. If you put your finger in front of you or your pen and you look at it, you know you can touch it pretty easily. But if you use one eye and you open and close it, does it look like your finger moves a little bit back and forth? So that allows us to use two eyes to see exactly where it's at. With one eye, it favors maybe this way, if we're talking about the right, and with the other eye to the left. But them together shows us exactly where something is located. Early on, that would be really important if you were swinging from tree to tree. So you could see exactly where a tree was, so you didn't smack into it. But eventually, it allows us to do things like grab specific fruit we want. And in combination, we have mutations that allow us to see color, which allows us to choose a nice ripe fruit. If you couldn't see the difference in color of a green banana and a yellow banana, the green banana is going to be really hard. It hasn't developed sugars that are more easily digestible to your body. It'll have more starchy things that need to be broken down first or a green banana, a yellow banana, and a black moldy banana, right? Moldy bananas are gonna have bacteria and fungi on them that are not healthy for you. So color vision really helps us with our eventual survival. Brains get bigger in mutations to the humans as opposed to other primates over time. We've taken a look at this too. Our heads are pretty big for our body size. We often see this in infants that sometimes infants, you'll see an infant who their head just looks enormous on their little bodies, right? Eventually we catch up to that, but that shows us that our head is not necessarily proportionate to our body size. More exaggerated when we're younger. Bigger brains allow us to think, see color, utilize other senses more accurately. allow us to have culture, to work together as a community, communicate. So our big brains help us with many things. Definitely see the importance of hand-eye coordination. Important for us today, things like driving or just not like walking into doors. You can precisely move your body together. Driving, that hand-eye coordination prevents you from hitting objects. And in the primates, we see this complex social interactions or cultures evolve. We also do see that in many other animal groups in a very advanced way. Other primates use the grooming technique uh, grooming is a social structure building exercise where they will pick parasites and bugs out of the fur of their friends or the someone who's higher than them, maybe a parent or maybe the leader of the group. 
You would groom them, you would pick the parasites off, and then they eat them. So imagine instead of saying, hi, I've missed you to your friend, you just walked up to them and started picking through their hair and ate something out of their hair as a way to say, hey, I missed you, we're friends. Weird. Weird for us, but it works in other primates. Okay, other things in terms of the advances in the head, changing of the brow ridge. We don't need that protection of our eyes, but also the position of the foramen magnum allows us to be more upright rather than two-legged, stooped, or four-legged. Remember in humans, it's straight underneath. Our spinal cord comes straight down. On gorillas, it's a little bit angular because they're more comfortable in this position. So having the foramen magnum underneath us allows us to be bipedal. Bi means two, pedal means foot. So that we exist on two feet as opposed to four. Lots of advantages for this. All the primates can do it, but humans primarily, that's our way of walking or moving. Again, you can see foramen magnum underneath allows for a tall stature and then angular. You're gonna use your hands to balance yourself out. Okay, so some of the reasons why bipedalism is an advantage. So your hands are free. If you have to go out hunting, it's going to be really hard to carry back what you just hunted for if you need to use your hands to balance out your body. If I go out hunting and I get this, and I got to walk back, I got to do it on three, right? I've got to be like this, or I've got to go like that. I might drop down, get dirty. Or as opposed to, I can be like, oh, I got this, I can take this, I can take this, and I can just walk away with it. So it's a lot easier to have your hands free. Also allows us to make tools and use them to cut things and throw things and write things. Makes you taller, makes it easier to grab food from up high. We can see further. So if I'm down here, can't see what's in the distance, but if I'm up here, oh, I can see predators are over there, so I'm going to go this way. I can see food in the distance. I can see lots of things going on, a storm coming. It's just a lot easier to move, right? If we had a race down the hall, and I told half of you, you got to crawl, and the other half of you stand up, you can run, we know that the runners are going to win. And we look bigger and scarier. So if we're crouched down, we don't look so big. Bears use this, where bears will be walking around. And if they get scared, they go. Then they look really big and scary. Other benefits in terms of our evolution. And again, we see this in many animal groups, but very specifically in the primates. and more advancements in the humans is the ability to have cultural systems. We can teach each other how to make tools, how to use them, share tips on sewing, on making tents, on communicating. We can share with each other, there's food over here. I'm going to use this tool to get it. Do you want to come with me? We can go into colder areas, take our tents and our clothes and the food and our tools, and just in general help each other. And when we have offspring, I could say to you, hey, I'm gonna go out and hunt. Can you watch my baby? And I'll bring you back food in exchange for you watching my baby. So we have ways to work together better, be more efficient as a group. So is this the skull of an ape or a human? Okay, so it's an ape because 
smaller brain cavity, larger jawbone, bigger teeth. We have a snout here, the brow ridge. All right, so a little bit about human evolution. We're almost done. Humans evolved from Africa. Our first human groups are called the hominins. Hominins. We diverged, start moving away with a series of mutations between five and eight million years ago, not that long ago. This stuff, I like to read the New York Times science section, and I see this stuff changing so quickly as they get more fossils and do more DNA testing on what they can get from the fossils. We're finding lots of changes. Um, Salian, Thropus, Chidensis was found in the African country of Chad relatively recently, maybe a few years back. Um, they think that this human ancestor was about six to eight million years ago. They believe it's one of our human ancestors, meaning bipedal, because the position of the foramen magnum is under. They also find other cultural aspects to um, contribute to the data that says that this is more of a human ancestor, but still retains many ape-like characteristics. And then we have Artie, he lived between, or they lived between four and six million years ago. We have a lot of ambiguity, ambiguity of when, again, because they're not finding whole skeletons between these early groups. And the early homonyms were small and a little bit furry. They were upright. So remember when we go back to Salianthropus and Arthropithecus, those are upright groups. So when I'm talking about these groups here, and especially Australopithecus about 4 million years ago from, Ans from Africa, up. This is an example of Australopithecus afarensis, smaller in size, less proportionate arms and legs, many ape-like characteristics, but also moving toward characteristics of the modern human. One thing you can really see here is that the head brain size gets a lot bigger in this offshoot species. Because they were still smaller in size, they were likely to be omnivores. They would eat a variety of fruits and veggies and meat, and probably more so out of necessity in that they just took what they could get. And one thing in terms of our brain's thinking is that if you saw a vulture flying around in circles and you see it going down, you know there's something dead there so that you could follow that vulture and find food. You could scavenge just like they did. Eventually, what we see is the Australopithecus lineage. They do die off for some reason. And predominantly in terms of modern humans, there's only the Homo genus left. There is some overlap in terms of a time of when they both existed, and we'll take a look at that at the end. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the history of the Homo genus. We see characteristics being favored of moving toward looking like us, bigger brains, flatter face, less hair, more proportionate arms and legs, our arms aren't so long and lanky and more social systems are advanced. So one of the earliest members of the Homo genus was Homo habilis. They called this the handyman because in terms of archeology span and what they found is a lot of tools around those skeletons. 
So lots of evidence that we have advances in tool use. Another member of the homogenous that we see in terms of specific tool use. Oh, as I stop here and just remember that body and brain larger, as I said, less ape-like features. And another group is Homo ergaster. About two million years ago, more proportionate. Arms are getting a bit shorter. They're getting a bit taller. Whenever you see an H period, and we've talked about this genus, this is symbolic of Homo erectus, just to point that out. And again, like I said, they're looking more modern, Homo erectus. Sorry, Homo ergaster. Homo erectus was known specifically for their tool use of making fire. So this is a game changer. So not only are we using tools, but now we know how to make fires and fires can do a bunch of different things for our nutrition. We can get different nutrients out of our food. If you've ever read about this, that fire really allowed us to get nutrients that we could never get out of our food by cooking. So tomatoes, for example, uh, when you eat a raw tomato, you get some different nutrients out of a cooked tomato. That process of cooking allows some metabolic activity to happen and allows some new chemical reactions that happen to give you advantageous type, types of nutrients. So it's always good to kind of learn about this stuff and, and see like, oh, it's probably good to eat both a raw tomato and a cooked tomato sometime in a week, for example, to get all those nutrients. Uh, fire also allowed us to go to other places where we can make fires and warm up so we could move into colder environments, not just from our clothing, but also from fires. Mutations happen from Homo ergaster to give rise to Homo heidelbergensis. Homo heidelbergensis gives rise to not only the Homo sapiens, which you and I belong, but also Homo neanderthalensis. They used to believe that we were the same species as the Neanderthals, but then further development in DNA technology allowed us to see that we are not both Homo sapien we would have been Homo sapien sapien, and they were Homo sapien Heidelbergen, sorry, Homo sapien neanderthalensis, but they are their own species, Homo neanderthalensis, and we are Homo sapiens. They were more so isolated to the European area. There are, um, there is evidence that we lived, some colonies lived in the same place together, the Homo sapiens and the Homo neanderthalensis. Eventually, something happens to the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, and the only modern humans left are us. A little bit about the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals probably initially got a really bad rap in terms of their intelligence. Um, they had much larger heads. So a larger head says larger brain, but for some reason, if you go back like 50 years, 60 years, um, to how they were drawn and illustrated in cartoons, for example, or movies, they made them seem really stupid. Big brain, stupid, maybe not. Probably not, right? Um, a lot of the reasons that made them seem stupid was that they died off. Did they die off to their stupidity or maybe a virus or something in the climate? Who knows? I have a question. Regarding 
regarding what you said about um, age and then it comes after a period, this means homo. Say again, what about homo? Uh, uh. Yeah, yeah, H period, yeah. A period would be Australopithecus, and then the species name, yeah. So again, changes in the DNA technology allowed them to have their own species de designation different than us. We used to think we were subspecies, but we're not of each other. We're our own species. So stereotypical, what we call the caveman. But living in caves is not a bad thing. If we think about we're going back a few million years, right? Because a cave is a house. That's kind of smart. So why do we associate that with being dumb? I don't know. Not really sure why. One of the mutations that favored them that we don't have are the bony projections in the skull. Um, so it's like bones that stick up on top. But that could be a good thing for like defending yourself if you had a big bony projection that didn't hurt your main skull structure. That would be a good thing. But they said, eh, not so smart. There were many other cultural traits that we share with them. So they found uh, pottery for cooking, for storing, a lot of other social systems in terms of the archaeology that they found around them. And again, why they died off, not necessarily due to their intelligence, but something happened. So general trend when we're looking at the homo genus is bigger body. We were little. We're getting bigger. Bigger brain. Remember, in terms of skull, smaller jaw, smaller teeth, flatter face, no brow ridge. More complexity and tool usage, very, very important for us moving out of Africa, colonizing other areas of the world. Less hair on our body, more proportionate arms and legs, bigger brain cavity. So the last question, um, I want you to use the tree on the other page to answer it. So take a look at time-wise, we're looking at modern day today. So this is today. We have a lot that have gone on in the last million years. This is two million years ago, three million years ago. So you're looking straight up and down like a graph of when something when one of these groups was alive. So let's answer this question, look at that chart, and figure out which groups evolved. So meaning that in the front would be the oldest, to the last would be the most modern. A clue to answering this would be to look for an Australopithecus at the beginning and Homo sapiens at the end. So right, I can get rid of this because that's at the end. That one I can keep, get rid of that one, and get rid of that one. So what's the answer? Yeah, so um, a really easy, or sorry, oh, these two. Or, sorry, these two are the last two choices. I was looking at that one, because these are in the end. And so then what's the answer again? Yeah, good. OK, so you're just looking for this one as the answer. Um, Highly recommend, just give that um, look over. I would definitely go over this question. This is one I think I like to ask. Okay, that's it. Thank you for hanging in there.